Hi Chloe, hi Jason, hi Liam, it's Uncle Brian. I'm at Fort Pulaski National Monument on Cockspur Island and the fort is right behind me here. You can see one of the moats and today I'm going to take you on a tour. So let's go. Kazimierz Pulaski. Hi, we're here with Ranger. Shannon. Hi Ranger Shannon. So say hi to my niece Chloe. Hi Chloe, and welcome we're... from Fort Pulaski. That's right, we're at historic Fort Pulaski. It's a national monument. And there is just tons of history here. There's so much history here. I'm never gonna be able to get through it all in just one video, right? I'll start off with some context for why this fort even gets built. The War of 1812, fought in 1812. Um, probably the most important thing that happens during that war is that uh, the US Capitol and the White House, they get burned by the invading British Army. Um, and so that kind of causes Americans to really wake up and think we need to do a better job protecting our cities, protecting our seaboard, our Atlantic coast. And so thus forms the idea for a system of masonry, which means bricks, forts, that are going to be built all along the eastern coast and even in the Gulf. If you actually want to step over here, we have a map of different third system, which is what we call the system of forts, all along the right. coast here and even into the Gulf. Because they had originally planned, what, something like 200 forts along the coast as part of the third system of forts, but only 30 got built? Yes, uh, they had really ambitious plans. Fort Pulaski is one that at the time was thought to be impregnable, correct? Yes, correct. And correct. why is that? So, um, the fort, again, masonry fort, um, there's billions of bricks that are used to construct this fort. 25 million bricks, is that incredible? 25 million. Mm -hmm. Blows yeah. my mind. Yeah, it's really incredible. Actually, if you want to step over here and yeah. look at the diagram, this gives you a good cross section of what actually is going on with the diagram, um, the inside of this, the fort here. Um, so, actually, something really unique about Fort Pulaski is the island it's on never was a, a solid land island. It was more salt marsh, it was all wetland. So, the engineers actually had to come in and construct a system of dikes and canals to dry out the land. One of the engineers, um, fresh out of West Point, is young Robert E. Lee. He's going to help out with uh, constructing the dike system. That's going to be his real important role here. That's right. Getting the land dry. Because he has kind of just graduated mm -hmm. in, what, 1829, I think? From He graduated second in his class from West Point in 1829. This was his first assignment. He left, but then I think returned at some point. So. He does return later on in the Civil War in a kind of different capacity. Um, he's actually relieved as an engineer, is replaced by a man named uh, Mansfield over here. Justin Mansfield, um, this handsome looking gentleman down here. Let's get a close up. Close up. Um, but he's going to take uh, be in charge of all the engineering aspects. He's here for 14 years. Um, something kind of interesting. Um, these two are going to cross paths again as adversaries at the Battle of Antietam in 1862 during the Civil War. And unfortunately, Mansfield is going to be mortally wounded on the battlefield as a result of Lee's army. Um, so it's kind of you know, a tragic connection there of our two engineers here at Pulaski. Um, but let's go back to the construction of the fort over here. Um, like I said, you know, they had to engineer this land to be dry to hold a massive structure like this on it. Um, that's part of the reason why the fort actually takes 18 years to be built. A lot of that is trying to figure out how to be create solid land that's going to hold a massive structure like this. Um, right, because these they used 70 foot pilings mm -hmm. that they had to sink in. Now they didn't have electricity, they didn't have cranes, they didn't have any kind of earth moving equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yet they managed to get these 70 foot pilings. Think about that, that's like a seven story building mm -hmm. that they sunk into the ground and then they used two layers of wood plank to support, mm -hmm. what, the 25 million bricks. Yes, yes. Um, a lot of this labor is becoming to different, different types of folks. We have some paid laborers from the uh, local Savannah area. We also do have a lot of enslaved laborers who are contracted out by their owners to the federal government. But these people are going to be yeah, using all manual labor, you know, using systems of heavy uh, pulleys and all sorts of manual stuff that we can't even fathom today to sink these piles into the ground, put a leg, two layers of wood on top, that's what we call the grillage. Um, and below that, there's a system of, called reverse arches, 
right? Um, below the fork. Oh, I um, see that. And see there's that? Mm -hmm. how it curves. Yep. Like that, and that helps support the structure. Yes. Oh um, wow. Also, we need fork scattered throughout. We have a system of cisterns which collect water. Um, you're gonna have water come on down, rain water, because again, we're on, a, we're right on the ocean here, so you have to find a way to collect fresh water that isn't the water surrounding us, because it's very salty. Uh, Rainwater is gonna come on down, filter through the terraplane, which is the earth up here. Um, it's actually a layer of oyster shells beneath that. Um, we, so that's going to filter the water know, there. If, what did they do with the oyster shells here? Uh, that's going to filter the water. Um, it's gonna, the water's going to seep through there, and they have a system of lead pipes. Um, the way this is uh, angled here is going to filter the water down into that single layer lead pipe. It's going to drip on down, and that pipe leads into the cisterns, which is where all that water is going to pool and collect. And that's how everyone who stayed at the fort got their fresh water. <laughs> And the cisterns still work today. We do have to empty them out every once in a while. Um, but beyond that... That's some pretty good engineering to it's, last that it's long. It's incredible. It's incredible. Our, our fort is almost 90% original. Um, most of the masonry is original. Uh, you see what the arches we have going on here. Those are called casemates. Each right. casemate is meant to hold a cannon. So our fort can hold upwards of 140 cannons when it's um, and the cannons of the time were the smooth bore cannons. Yes, um, early in the 19th century, um, we have an almost entirely smooth bore, which means it's smooth on the inside. These cannons can go up to about a mile. Um, they're pretty effective. Our fort is a med to defend. You know, we have coming in on the front side of the fort, um, we have you know, two sets of wooden doors. We have multiple draw bridges you have to cross. We have a moat. A moat? Um, we have a moat. We have a I moat. can't wait to see it. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, but that's to defend against a landward invasion of infantry soldiers with rifles and muskets coming in. Maybe mortars and other smooth bore. And one of the things, being on Coxburgh Island and where Fort Pulaski is, is we're near the mouth of the Savannah River, so it's very strategic. Yes. And they thought that with this mortar construction, it was impregnable. Yes. And in fact, I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote that said, you might as well be attacking the Rocky Mountains. Yes, no, exactly. Um, something I was going to mention with the, you know, we have the land side, which is very, you know, there's a lot of fences, the moat, the doors, the drawbridges, but on the other side, again, our fort is shaped like a pentagon. On the four other sides of the fort, we only have the moat. We don't have anything else. And that, those sides are meant to defend against a seaborne invasion. So sailing ships coming out from the Atlantic down the Savannah River. This is meant to choke, be a choke point so no one can get past us, go up the river to threaten Savannah. Right. Um, and again, wooden sailing ships, they can't stay in one place for too long. And they can't carry cannons large enough exactly. to penetrate the brick. Exactly. And so the brick is how thick? 12 feet? 15? I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, so, and so they couldn't, they weren't worried about attacks from ships because they knew they couldn't get big enough smoothbore cannons on them to harm the fort. That and a ship that's constantly in motion with, you know, guns that aren't super accurate for long distances, the fear is they can't penetrate one spot over and over and over again to do serious damage. So, right. You know, they can get shots along the wall, but smoothbore cannons, which again are like giant bowling balls, they're not going to break through the wall. So no one's really concerned about that which leads to the Civil War. Um, early in 1861, the Georgia State Militia is going to take port from the United States. Late in 1861, though, the U.S. Army is there trying to instigate a blockade of the Confederate coast. Um, they take Hilton Head Island up in South Carolina, and then they take Tyagi Island, which is just out this way, um, a little over two miles away. From right, Minnesota. so Tybee Island is really the closest landmass they can assault from exactly. with ground based cannons. Exactly. And you could not use a smooth bore cannon at the time to project that far. And then this new idea, this new weapon, the rifled cannon. What is that about? Yeah, so the Confederates, you know, they know the US is out there. They're not super concerned. Uh, this is when Lee comes back to play. He's in uh, command of uh, the Georgia coast. Uh, I think he's up South Carolina and East Florida. He's in charge of making sure this position is defended. Well, um, but he, him, and the you know, Confederate commander, Fort Charles O. said they're not super concerned about the U.S. being out there. They know they're trying. They're going to probably try to take the fort, but they they're ready to settle into a siege because the fort, as it has been thought, is impregnable. 
The problem is for them is the U.S. is using this new technology, uh, rifle artillery, which means the inside of the barrel of the cannon it has grooves in it. And so, right, like a squirrel, like, exactly. woo, so like that. Exactly. Compared to you know throwing a basketball at something versus throwing a football at a spiral at something. And that's what they did with these cannons on Tybee Island, exactly. is they used, and there weren't that many of them. They're all set up like this. Something, it, this is fascinating because, again, this is all salt marsh, sand. These Union soldiers, they, they don't have horses that can go in the, in the sand here. The horses are super effective here. So a lot of these guns are dragged by hand. Um, in the fort, you'll see we have... Um, so this is Tybee mm -hmm. down here. The light station is... Um, it's, it's over it's here. It's a, a light station way over there. Mm -hmm. And this is the fort on mm -hmm. Coxspur Island. And so you can see the distance that they had to fire these rifle cannons. Mm -hmm. And that that's just amazing. It is incredible. And yeah. now they offered, he was 25 years old, mm -hmm. and so he's a very young man to be in command of a fort. Yes. And what was his name? Charles Olmsted. Charles Olmsted. And they sit across a captain to offer him surrender. Right to say, hey, we're getting ready to attack you so that there's no immediate loss of life. Will you surrender? And he said, no, I am here to defend. See you later. Yeah, exactly. The attack began mm -hmm. and it did not last very nope. long. It's about 30 hours, um, so the whole day and then the next into the next morning. Uh, the problem, the reason that causes almost dead to shift to the thinking is. Um, the corner that they were penetrating, which is this uh, southeast corner over here, right. it's directly across from over this corner is the powder magazine for 40,000 pounds of explosive black powder was being kept. So the um, U.S. had actually had there's a Confederate inspector who came over and gave them a lot of information about how many men are in the fort, where their powder is, etc. So they knew exactly where they wanted to target the fort. Um, so they're going to blow two 15-foot holes in this uh, corner here. And that's going to, there are going to be shells that are going to be making their way through, come through the holes, and they start exploding in this corner. And that's enough for Olsa to, you know, make the, you know, kind of a really hard decision as he surrendered the fort. Um, when he surrendered, I mean, he made a comment like it, it was very clear mm -hmm. we were not going to win this. He knew it was over. It was it was faded. Yeah, he actually, saw the damage that was done. Yeah, here we have the sword that he turned over oh. when he surrendered, which is right Look at here. That. Jason, look at that. You would like that. The surrender came out, general in charge of the force. He issued what amounted to a proclamation. Mm -hmm. And in that he said, all slaves in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina are free. And he began recruiting the recruiting black soldiers mm -hmm. into the Union Army. Yes, that's correct. April 1862. Hunter does issue an order before 11, before saying three states are free, he starts with what smaller, saying all enslaved people on the island, on Cockspur Island, are free. There are um, a handful of slaves here. One of them actually has an interesting story. March Haynes, his name is. Um, he's What's the name again? March Haynes. March Haynes, mm -hmm. okay. He's, um, he's enslaved in Savannah and he's brought out here to do some carpentry work. So he's here during the bombardment. Um, and so when David Hunter, the US Army comes out here, he's free. Um, and so, he, you know, but he doesn't decide to go on and, you know, go home and whatever. He actually decides to go back to Savannah multiple times um, and help other enslaved people come to freedom. Um, he offers his services as a spy for the Union Army. Um, and he even joins a regiment of the United States Color Troops further on down the line. So this man is getting in it. And now what's interesting is 10 days after that, President Abraham Lincoln, in which he basically countermands Hunter's order, proclamation, mm -hmm. saying, no, 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 we are not freeing the slaves. We're not making that announcement right now. This is like the second time he's done this, that he actually rescinded a similar order when the state of Missouri had made a proclamation. And and what can you tell us about that? So Lincoln, you know, rescinds General Order Number 11. He says, you know, for multiple reasons, you know, that is outside anyone's authority, you know, we. We, you know, have footholds in Savannah here. We have some in, on the coast of South Carolina, but we do not control these states. And at that time, the U.S. Army's policy is wherever the U.S. Army is, um, enslaved people can come to our lines, and if they come to our lines, and they're free. But we can't go out of our way to try to free them actively. So we can't entice any of them to come to us. 
nor can we free any slaves in Larry's control. control. Um, and also, Lincoln has a very keen sense of making sure that civilian authority mm -hmm. is on top of military authority. So, people like David Hunter and then uh, John Fremont out in Missouri, they're military commanders. Right, they, and they're making policy. Exactly. Basically, they're making public policy yep. and they're issuing law mm -hmm. in essence. President Lincoln maybe is thinking, wait, I have to protect the authority of the office of the president. Mm -hmm. Because it, it really was just six and a half, half months later that he announces the Emancipation Proclamation, exactly. which is January 1st, 1863. Yep, he issues a preliminary emancipation on September 22nd, 1862, after the Battle of Antietam, which goes into effect on January 1st. Um, but Lincoln, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation had its origins in the summer of 1862. Uh, the Second Confiscation Act basically says that the president has the authority to issue a proclamation freeing all enslaved people. Um, so that's kind of the legal basis for what he does in September. He just doesn't want to do it immediately because the U.S. Army isn't doing so great in the field and he wants some semblance of victory to be able to do that. So well, and I ever. think, you know, he did it relatively quickly, he did. but he did have concerns that in Europe it would be seen if he rescinded it that quickly that it would look like the Union was making a land grab. Yeah, like exactly. they were, so he was concerned about that and then he, he rescinded it also, as I read, in part because he was concerned that the Union citizens who owned slaves might defect. Lincoln had always, even from 1861, um, something I, a story I found pretty fascinating, at another third system fort in Virginia, Fort Monroe, um, it's held by the U.S., it's never taken by Confederates, but uh, the Confederates obviously, they want to get out Fort Monroe, so they start building entrenchments and trying to get out the fort, um, and so some of these Confederate officers bring uh, slaves with them, and so these slaves are being put to work digging entrenchments, bringing up ammunition and stuff, and so one night, three of them go to Fort Monroe, they escape, uh, present themselves to the commander there being like, we're here, what are you going to do with us? Um, because traditionally the policy would have been just to send them back because the right. U.S. Army wasn't in the business of interfering with people's property. But the U.S. commander there kind of spins around that whole logic that slaves are property, saying if they're property, you know, we can seize your horses, we can seize your shovels, so why can't we seize your slaves as Contraband is the word they use right. as war, a war. So that's kind of the basic, that's like the first moment where the U.S. Army government has to confront this issue of emancipation, which is, you know, intrinsically linked with the war. And from there, you know, it's, it's a very complicated political process. Like you said, there's the border states, which are uh, slaveholding states that are remain uh, uh, to the Union, like Missouri, Maryland, Kentucky, Delaware. Um, Lincoln always has his eye on those states. Um, especially because they're on the border, you know, if he loses them, that would be pretty, pretty uh, bad for the Union cause. So he right. has his eye on them, he has his eye on the Northern public, because there are a lot of Northerners who hear emancipation and they automatically, they don't want anything to do with that. Right. Um, so now you had mentioned that I did not know about, I hadn't found it in my research, something called General Order Number 7. Mm -hmm. And 7, prime number, mm -hmm. is that a coincidence? I'm not sure. No. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So that's the one he issues right before he does the three statewide order. Um, General Order Number 7 says that all the people on Hotspur Island, so the island of Port Pulaski is. Well, oh, that's what you were saying before. Yes. And that is what General Order Number mm -hmm. 7 is, is, yes. is very specific to the island. Yes. Oh, so that, okay. That was in line with the U.S. policy Time. You know, okay. Lincoln had no problem with him doing that. It's just when you exceed your reach by three whole states, that's when right. Lincoln has a bit of an issue. Tell me about what you see here. So these are examples of smooth bore ammunition. So again, these are like massive, massive bowling balls. Right. Like solid shot. This is what traditionally was used in smooth bore cannons. This is the the weapon of the time. Right. Um, things start to change when you have things that are a little shaped like this that are shaped like this. These are rifle projectiles, they're called bolts. Look at um, that. See, it kind of looks like a bullet, right? Exactly, that's what and I tell people, it's like a giant bullet. This is another example of... A uh, bolt, which is a rifle projectile. And so uh, this is what they bullet. were firing from mm -hmm. Tybee Island. Yes. Wow. Yes, um, if you go on outside the fort, uh -huh. um, you should be able to see shells left in the wall from that bombardment. That's great. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. Great. Okay. So now we're going to go and take a tour of the fort.
If you're ready, let's go. I'm standing like right at the edge of the moat here. Right on the edge, very edge right here. So this was to help keep people to, from just like rushing up against the wall, trying to maybe put ladders and climb over the top. But look, you can see where the rifled cannon shells came across from Tybee Islands, almost two miles away and struck the fort. And if we look down here, we're gonna see even more of them. Look at that. They're just everywhere. And so as Ranger Shannon was saying, 90% of the masonry of the brick that you see here is original. And so what we're looking at is like the actual damage done by these rifle cannon shells coming across from Tybee Island, two miles away, and hitting the side of the pool. It's right here. So I'm gonna show you something else that's cool that I just saw right behind me here. Look, I'm gonna turn you around. It's a cannon! We're gonna walk over there and take a look at it. And look down there at the end. We're gonna zoom in here a little bit so we can see them better. Pretty cool. Okay, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna walk around the rest of the exterior of the fort here. Drawbridge over the moat! <sighs> cool! What do you think? Should I go for it? Just leap across? Probably not. <laughs> it's locked. It's locked. They don't want me to go in. It's locked! <laughs> okay, yeah, you can see they've got the ground built up around the fort to help protect it against kind of attacks and bombardments and shells and things like that. Right or left? Right or left? Let's go to the right. What is this? Where are we going? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, we're coming back outside, okay? So, let's go back out. Yeah. Oh, wow. There were three entrances to this little area I'm standing in now. So we've got the walls here of the fort. Back inside the fort! All right, so I came down another one of those little staircases, look. For right there, and down here, jail cell, look. Look at this. One point in time, there were 600 prisoners here. So after the war, there were 600 prisoners here. They called them the Immortal 600. So I don't know why, maybe a future video. So we'll find out, but it sounds like a movie title, doesn't it? The Immortal 600. Main gate, we're going in. Okay, we're inside the fort, in the center of the fort, and get in. So this is the area, I'm gonna go pan around here so you can see what the inside of it. So big open area, and Right behind us here, where you can see those windows and stuff, that was where the officers slept, those officers' quarters. Otherwise, most of the enlisted soldiers, they slept in tents, slept in tents, like here, in the yard, and in the other area where we were just in before we came in here. So they would stay in tents, the officers got to sleep inside. Bunk beds. Okay, this is the quartermaster's office. So quartermaster is the one who had all of the goods, right? So he would supply everybody with stuff. Doesn't look too comfortable. No memory foam mattresses. <laughs> so this is the infirmary. Infirmary, think of it like a hospital. This is where they would bring sick people or injured people and try to make them better. Okay, 
so behind me this big cannon this is a 42 pounder so it shot a cannonball that weighed 42.5 pounds okay so we're gonna go up on the top I'm outside so I don't need this right now on the inside you gotta wear the mask on the outside they said no you don't have to but these stairs I think go to the top all the way up that's where we're going we're at the top it wasn't too bad a climb just just one story two stories I think it's a two-story high board but uh, why do I keep going to places that have steep stairwells <laughs> why are these steep stairwells I keep going there oh no but this is what it looks like where we were just at down there and all the rooms we walked through right down there we're gonna take a look over the wall from the top. Look at this cannon behind me. We're gonna go take a look at it now. It's huge. This is sitting up at the very top. You know, the duck is looking out. So we're gonna fire that way. There's one down on the corner right down there. You can see they had these all across the top up here. Right now there's just a few of them on display. Okay, so that was our tour of Fort Pulaski National Monument. Special thanks to the National Park Service and especially Ranger Shannon. Super smart, oh my gosh. It's great to meet her. Thank you, Shannon. And goodbye, Chloe. Goodbye, Liam. Goodbye, Jason. Love you. Goodbye, goodbye, see you later See you later, alligator Uncle Brian has got to go This is the end of his show Wave goodbye to Cousin Pete Clap your hands and stomp your feet Hey Chloe, what a oh It's the end of the show